uh, not only do we have that, as we're going to talk about in a moment, for the great creatures we call the dinosaurs, but we have it for other creatures as well. Well, now, most of the big creatures disappeared after the canopy, which you eloquently explained uh, about earlier, fell. Silly people, the crystalline canopy didn't fall. It was destroyed when Dr. Kyla Marr emitted a continuous graviton pulse at it. Everybody knows that. All right, this is a warning about the next clip I'm going to show. Um, now, the stupid in this next clip is, is actually to a high enough point that it can be damaging to your health. It could even be fatal, okay? Um, now, lots of people have attempted to watch this. Many men have tried. They tried and failed? They tried and died. Exactly. Now, um, now, I myself, personally, I am somewhat immune to the effects of, of the stupid because I've, I've been, um, well, actually doing, it's a, a mystical forest therapy, um, which enables me to handle a, a high, vo high volume of stupidity um, without actually losing my life. But for others, um, it, it, you, if, you're, if you're sensitive to stupid, um, I, I recommend that you skip this next bit here. Uh, and for an explanation of the biology behind how stupid can be lethal, I'm going to refer you to a great researcher, uh, Texamosis, who, who has made an excellent video who, where, where all of this is explained. And we lost all of whatever that canopy supplied to us, except the few managed to survive. And one is the magnificent blue whale. Do you have any idea why he could survive when those great dinosaurs did not survive? Okay, stupid number one. Um, he's talking about the blue whale, and what, what is, what's on the picture he shows? What is that? Oh, it's a fucking humpback whale. So we're taking science lessons from somebody so fundamentally bad at what they do that they don't know the difference between a blue whale and a humpback whale. And lest anybody think that, well, they're close enough or they're similar, they look completely different. They, they are, they're unmistakably not the same thing, okay? He has two advantages. One, he, he dives and lives in cold water. Why is cold water important? Well, we'll go to a graph in just a second. All right. Okay. But the colder water is, the more propensity it has for holding oxygen in insoluble content. Okay. See, I, now I apologize. I'm, I'm wrong. Um, see, cold water does. I, I, that's a fact. I looked it up. Cold water actually holds more dissolved oxygen in it than does warm water. Um, so therefore, the blue whale, or the humpback even, um, when they're living in the ocean and breathing water and extracting oxygen through their gills, um, you know, they're able to get more oxygen in their blood, right? Oh, wait, do they have gills? Oh no, they breathe atmospheric fucking oxygen, idiot. I mean, what the hell does the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water gonna do for an air-breathing mammal. Tell me. As you heat it up, that goes away. And in fact, uh, at uh, near boiling temperatures, there is no propensity for holding oxygen at all. It just starts going out. It's just uh, flat. And I bet this explains the relative rarity of whales in um, you know, volcanic thermal pools. Uh, he has cold water, and in addition, when he takes a breath, he submerges to the depths and pressurizes that, and that helps to push it into solubility in his bloodstream. If you haven't guessed it, pretty much everything he said there was a steaming pile of bullshit, okay? He practically got nothing right. Um, and uh, sort of to illustrate the point, I'm going to uh, switch to the narration mode here and show you a, some photos and video uh, from a research cruise in uh, up to the Aleutian Islands that I did la summer before last. Uh, and we got to see a sperm whale. That was weird. Um, anyway, this sperm whale was at the surface in between dives. Um, I'll switch now and explain. All right, here is a photo of the sperm whale at the surface. Uh, it is, it was, it remained at the surface here for about 45 minutes um, in between these dives, and then it finally, uh, I'll show a, a, another photo where it, it dove um, and was gone. Um, and during that time, the boat stopped uh, so we could observe it and. Um, a lot of people have got pictures. This photo right here is actually taken by Gary Drew. Uh, not by my camera sucks at these kinds of pictures. Um, I did get a little video footage, but it's it. it I'll show it here in a bit. It's kind of choppy and. Um, but anyway, the point is, is that the whale is at the surface. What he's doing at the surface is he's breathing. He's just breathing in and out, remaining relatively motionless. Uh, what this is doing is he is oxygenating his muscle tissue. Okay, he's not taking a breath full of air, then diving deep to 
to for it to force the oxygen into his tissues. That is a load of crap. Okay, uh, what he's doing is he's sitting there breathing. Now they have a a protein type in their muscles called myoglobin. Whales have an extremely dense quantity of myoglobin. Uh, what this does, it, it, myoglobin actually binds oxygen better than hemoglobin does. So as they're breathing in, their blood is carrying oxygen. It's being stored in their muscle tissue. Okay, so they're not storing oxygen in their lungs; they're storing it in their muscle tissue. Um, then during the dive, those muscles are giving up that oxygen uh, for basic metabolic function. Is that hopefully that made sense. Okay, they're not pressurizing it. They're not. I mean. That whole thing that he said there. In fact, when whales dive below a certain depth, um, if I'm not, I, I believe it's below 40 meters. Um, I may be wrong on that. Uh, they actually will exhale the, any remaining oxygen in their lungs to prevent it from going into solution in their blood. You know, the bends. When the, that that's one of the reasons that um, deep diving whales. Now the blue whale or the humpback whale, as he shows in the picture. Now these aren't even deep diving whales. That that's what was kind of laughable as well. I mean, they 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 can um, they they will not remain underwater for longer than forty minutes at a time. Okay, they don't they don't do this these deep dives like this. Uh, um. Whale does, um, and a few others like the be so a lot of the beaked whales. I think I think uh, they can even outdo the sperm um. whale in um, in diving ability. Vitally important because at Texas A and M University. They found that if you double the atmospheric pressure, you triple the assimilation of available oxygen. That is correct. So gulping the air in the atmosphere and diving is necessary for him to saturate the deep cell tissue with oxygen. Right. For, this made me laugh for a couple of reasons. One, um, Bao uses uh, Texas A&M for a wide variety of claims. I think that because of where he's from, that, that sort of adds an air of legitimacy to whatever he happens to be pulling out of his ass or making up on the spot, you know, a research done at Texas A&M. He throws that in there. Um, that's what I think, because there's no, I can't find a single source for this claim. Um, there's a couple of things wrong with this, okay? So you double the atmospheric pressure, you triple the solubility of oxygen, okay? Now, first of all, again, that's in water. Um, we're not the, the oxygen carried in the blood of a living creature um, has very little to do with the solubility of oxygen in water because blood has a carrier molecule that that binds to oxygen. It's a whole different. It's a different scenario. But um, that little fact right there, first of all, violates Henry's law. Um, and this is the beauteous part of it. He shows a chart. Uh, down, I was just remember that fact. Okay, double atmospheric pressure, triple the amount of oxygen at solubility in water. Okay, that's what he's saying right here. Um, now, in, in the, at the end of this next clip, uh, Doctor Mitchum shows a chart that basically makes bullshit out of what Bao just claimed. Uh, so keep it in mind to show you why the evolutionary model does not really address all the issues. Yeah, because the uh, solubility of gases in liquid and uh, the chemistry of water are, are absolutely the same thing uh, as changes in allelic frequencies over time. They're exactly the same. That's why we haven't addressed that problem yet. Okay, here is a chart of some various aquatic animals, starting on the left with the, the trout, the North American trout, which needs a tremendous amount of oxygen in the water to survive and thrive. Now, he can exist in lower oxygen levels like some of these other species can. We have the smallmouth bass, the mayfly larva, the stonefly larva, the catfish, which we have down in the south here where we don't have cold waters. You see why he thrives here. We have the carp, takes a little more oxygen, and then we have the mosquito, which takes almost no oxygen. Isn't that surprising? Mm. To thrive and survive mm. in stagnant waters. I'd like to know why he included the mosquito in that chart. Um, given, I know the larvae are aquatic, but they don't breathe they don't have gills. They don't breathe water. They actually have a little snorkel at the t at the end of their abdomen that sticks up above the water's surface. If you ever if you look at a stagnant pool where there are mosquito larvae, you'll see that they're all sort of resting at the top at the surface. And then when you disturb them, they do their little wiggly thing back down to the bottom. But they spend their time at the surface breathing air. So the amount of oxygen dissolved in water doesn't mean diddly squat to a mosquito larva any more than it means to a whale. 
Now, looking at this content, that's over six milligrams per liter of oxygen required to keep a trout alive and thriving in the waters. Do you understand now why we don't have any in the Paluxy River? Absolutely. Okay. Now, looking at the chart below, taking these same numbers down here, you can see, and again, this is in water, a similar uh, solution to blood, which is a very high percentage of water. Yes. We are approximately 71% water, give or take, depending on hydration. Uh, you and can the see. The is higher than that, even. That is correct. You cannot use the solubility of oxygen in water as a model for how much oxygen an organism can carry in its blood, okay? Because of the fact that blood has a carrier molecule that binds to oxygen called hemoglobin. Blood, in fact, at the same temperature as water, can carry 70 times more oxygen in it than would normally dissolve in an equal amount of water. 70 times. So these charts are all meaningless. You can see that we're gaining at our current present situation of 20.9 percent oxygen from about 4.4 grams per liter up to the required six to get uh, uh, the fish happy you require 30 percent oxygen in air again this chart is at 25 degrees centigrade this water is obviously much colder than that that's why you can't have the trout in room temperature water all right this is what I like to call palming the pea okay he's he's this is a, a game he's playing. So we, he's talking about dissolved oxygen in blood, and then he's switching to water, and then he's switching to 25-degree uh, temperature. Uh, why would you need... Okay, he's saying you would need a an atmospheric concentration of oxygen at 30% just to make the f trout happy um, at 25 degrees Celsius water. Trout don't live in 25 degrees Celsius water, okay? They live in colder water where those that atmosphere amount of oxygen isn't required, okay? Because of the how more readily it dissolves in cold water. He talks about that. So he's completely playing a shell game here. He's, he's switching around terms. Um, and he's basically just making stuff up. Uh, you'll see in a bit here. Doesn't solve the problem. You go on up. 35% uh, oxygen, 7.3, uh, 40% oxygen. Now this is getting into real volatility. Yes, the evolutionary community has not addressed the issue of having that kind of ratio of oxygen which they state would be required for uh, the metabolism of the great dinosaurs. Right. But that generates a volatile context. Yes, the evolutionary community has not addressed that problem, the problem that Bao just completely made up with his made-up figures and made-up numbers. Yeah, we, should, we, we, we need to get on that right away. So we believe the solution is actually here. About 25% oxygen, which is supported by the Landis research and others. And if you'll simply boost the pressure, the atmospheric pressure, Henry's law will push that same percentage up to 10.5 at room temperature. Okay, now this is this made me laugh because okay, think about this. Oh, so now remember back when Bao said that that the Texas A and M researchers showed that uh, under double atmospheric pressure that that you triple the oxygen carrying capacity of water. Um, that, that I'm assuming by saying that he was he meant at our our twenty percent oxygen uh, saturation. Um, so I'd like to know this chart kind of. Essentially, if you if you compensate for the twenty five percent and go back to twenty, it's it it's approximately doubles the amount of it, which is within Henry's law. Henry's law: if you double the pressure, you're going to double the amount of of oxygen dissolution in water. Uh, so where did his triple come from? It's certainly not supported by this. Now the practical application of this is profound. Yeah, I agree. It has actually has a lot of practical applications. Um, I'm thinking, looking at it, that if you could use that chart and um, start a fire, you know, under your kindling in a fireplace, uh, you could probably turn it over on the back and, um, you know, your kids could draw on it or you could put it up on the fridge to write messages on. Um, it's probably a little stiff to wipe your ass with. But anyway, um, I'm sure you guys can come up with a wide number, uh, a large number of uh, practical applications for it.